October 1st, day one of October. Yay. Welcome to my morning face. And um, got up at 5.30 with Arthur to give him a bottle. And as soon as I realized it was October, I knew I was not getting back to sleep. But I was okay with that because I can just go to bed early if I want to tonight or it's fine. I've honestly gotten used to getting up kind of early. So, but it's nice because he's back to sleep now and I'm still awake. So I'm making some tea and then I'm going to get started on my very first read. And I have, um, the calendar. I love the October picture. This is just a little like target dollar calendar I have. Um, but I think it's so pretty how subdued all the colors are. So I'll show you my read in just a minute when my tea's ready. Okay, so I am starting my buddy read with the Mary Stewart ladies, plus the lovely Kate from the Novel Nomad of The Trail of the Serpent by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. I, I'm really ashamed that it's been a year since I've read a Mary Elizabeth Braddon. That was my first one, so this is only my second one, and I just know I want to read so many of her books. So I couldn't be more pleased, and I have the Victorian Gothic playlist going on Spotify. I have my little bookmark ready and my <laughs> drop it gel pen for annotating. I'm good to go. And I think actually I will get a scented candle now as well. To add my basic plan for Victober, um, I have a lot of books on my TBR and I am just planning on having buddy reads. That will be my first priority every day getting through those and that will make me feel like I've made some progress and if I don't get to some of the books I don't get to some of them but I'll be happy if I keep up with buddy reads so that is my general plan and um I'm just so excited so um it is a little bit later and I finished the first six chapters of the trail of the serpent and wow just wow I couldn't have picked a better book to, you know, be the inaugural reading of Victober. Um, this is really intense and atmospheric and full of really fascinating characters. Um, there's a mute detective, which you don't see disability a lot in Victorian novels. So already fascinating. Um, and, uh, Jabez North is the name of the villain in this. It says it, you know, right on, right on the cover. He's just known for being the villain. Um, and he is scary. Uh, I think this one is way more intense than Lady Audley's Secret. It might not end up being more intense, but right now, just the beginning was like, she really packed a punch in those first six chapters. So I'm really looking forward to carrying on with this. And it's, you know, so what I'm in the mood for and definitely looking forward to this. So I will let you know how I carry on with that. I think I might try to read two chapters of The Small House at Allington or just start those. That'll be my uh, my morning reading while the boys are maybe still asleep. Um, but I'll read it over breakfast too. I'm really excited to get back to Trollope. So I'll let you know how that all goes. What are you doing? Um, jumping. Why are you allowed to jump now? Because the killing it is out of the house. That's right. Our downstairs neighbor moved out, and I'm letting Peter jump around all he wants downstairs this morning with foggy goggles. <laughs> you want to show a jump? Yeah. I'm going to show Daddy my big jump. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, no, on the other side. So we decided to do a quick walk to the towpath. There's the pedestrian bridge up there. It's a really cool walk, but that takes a little bit longer. So we're just doing a quick one before quiet rest time on the towpath. You can go. Peter has decided to wear his hoodie draped on his back. <laughs> so there he is.
I'm reading my next chapters for The Small House of Allington and Anthony Trollope. Uh, he says, There is a class of young men who never get petted, though they may not be the less esteemed or perhaps loved. They do not come forth to the world as Apollos, nor shine at all. Such young men are often awkward, ungainly, and not yet formed in their gait. They straggle with their limbs and are shy. Words do not come to them with ease when words are required among any but their accustomed associates. And then at the, he ends with, In truth, they are not as yet men, whatever the number may be of their years, and they are no longer boys. The world has found for them the ungraceful name of Hobbledehoy. So here is my crazy Victober reading schedule. Um, I know it's crazy, but I had so many books I was trying to get through and I really wanted to keep track of everything. Um, I could have written it all down, but it just seemed overwhelming. Um, and so, I mean, if I don't read everything, I don't read everything, but then it is very satisfying when I do read something. I'll go up. You can see here, like I've, I cross a line through it. Um, so I do think I was also trying to read the mayor of Casterbridge this week, but I think that's not realistic. So unfortunately I think it's got to move down a week, but then I'm worried I'll miss it. If I don't do it this week, I do have it on audiobook, So we shall see, um, how things continue with that. But yeah, here's the schedule. So it is very satisfying to, um, to cross a line through it whenever I'm done with it. So you can see, I haven't listened to any Emily Bronte poems. Uh, and I would like to do that. And then John Halifax, a gentleman is taking longer to get through than I thought, but it is what it is. Was only sullen there. There was not one but wished to shun my aspect void of cheer. The very grey rocks looking on asked, What do you do here? And I could utter no reply. In sooth. I am just not feeling John Halifax a gentleman. I picked it up and as soon as started I started reading again, I just started like wishing I wasn't reading. And I've had an amazing reading year this year because I have not hesitated to DNF. And I used to think I wouldn't DNF classics, but when you're going through more obscure Victorian books, like there might be a reason some of them are more obscure. Uh, yeah, it's so sad because I want to love every book I read, but that's just not realistic. Um, and I'm, I need to be so okay with that because it's not like I couldn't pick it up again if I wanted, or I can't, pick it up after I finish the mayor of, Ca mayor of Casterbridge, but I just keep longing to read the mayor of Casterbridge. Um, because I don't know, I just, um, the buddy read I'm doing next week with Katie is a really long book and I'm worried I'll have less time for extra books besides buddy reads, which it's a book I really want to read buddy read, but I just definitely want to have time for this. So I don't like, who am I going to be in trouble with if I DNF it? Um, I mean, people have, people have left weird comments. I did a video on DNFing and people left some real, like some people are really mad when you DNF, but it's like most people are not. So anyhow, darn it. I'm going to enjoy Victober and I'm picking up the mayor of Castor Bridge. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm excited. I'm going to do that. Like I said, John Halifax, a gentleman, it's not even taking up physical space in my house. It's on my e-reader. So I'm just going to leave it on there and I'm going to come back to it if I feel the urge. It is kind of a bummer though, because the narrator is crippled and you really don't see disabilities much in Victorian literature. So I am bummed about that because it was interesting to read him represented and contrasted. The narrator's name is Phineas and he's contrasted with John. I might come back to it, but it's just not pulling me in as much as I'd like. And like I said, I read like 90 pages. So I feel like that's long enough to know. Hi everyone. I have gone upstairs for a few minutes, quick minutes before they notice that I'm up here. Um, but I just wanted to give more thoughts on whether or not I will continue to read John Halifax, a gentleman. And 
uh, I think it possibly could be a book I would DNF, but I think it also possibly some classics are not meant to be sped through. So that's what I'm going with. I'm just going to read a chapter when I feel like it, and I'm not even going to feel pressure to finish it during Victober. If it's finishing it slowly and enjoying it or rushing it and just not enjoying it at all, you know what I mean? If those are my two choices, but I don't know if they are my two choices, but however, I definitely made the right choice because so good and no problem at all just while I was like tidying the kitchen up and cooking I listened to the first 32 pages um and uh typically with Hardy I like to sit and like underline listen to the audiobook also I like to like really be immersed with Hardy um so I was able to go back and like underline the different things that I had noticed and the thing that I have just been having so much fun with is when you arrive, when the reader arrives in the town of Casterbridge, he has so many descriptions talking about how it's a Friday evening and the topography of the land and the layout of the city and um, the different shops and all the different kinds of shops that are there and the um, woodland areas and the plant life. And uh, he says um, that, yeah, the, the agricultural and pastoral character of the people upon whom the town depended for its existence was shown by the class of objects, sides, reap hooks, sheep shears, bill hooks, spades, mattocks and hoes at the ironmongers, beehives, butter firkins, churns, smoking stools and pails, hay rakes, uh, field flagons and seed lips. Um, and then they came to the grizzled church whose massive square tower rose unbroken into the darkening sky, the lower parts being illuminated by the nearest lamps. Um, the curfew was still rung in Casterbridge, and it was utilized by the inhabitants as a signal for shutting their shops. Uh, and so it says other clocks struck eight from time to time, one gloomily uh, from the gowl and another from the gable of an almshouse with a preparative creak of machinery more audible than the note of the bell and then the chimes were heard stammering out the sicilian mariner's hymn so of course i had to look up that tune and it is a hymn tune that i've heard a lot and it's really beautiful so i'll just cut over to a clip where you can hear that um and then it talks about a group of women walking and uh, one of them carrying a loaf of bread and then pulling pieces off and feeding it to the other women. <sighs> I just love his writing so much. Just setting the stage so well for how things are going to be. I just love this. And then uh, another party says the dense trees of the avenue rendered the road dark as a tunnel, though the open land on each side was still under a faint daylight. In other words, they passed down a midnight between two gloamings. Oh, I love the term gloaming for like dusk, but I only see Victorian authors use it. So yeah, I'll play you. Um, I'll let you hear a clip of that song because it was so beautiful. And that's why another way that I think is really fun to read classics is to look up any music that you come across. And it also just, I just loved this picture of them coming in and it's, the it's you know it's really starting to get dark and it's this kind of sleepy little town and then it made me even picture it more vividly to know the music that was playing so enjoy But I see you have not finished supper. Aye, but I will be done in a little. You needn't go, sir. Take a seat. I've almost done, and it makes no difference at all. Have you taken your eight-month picture? Are we all done? We're all done. 
you can crumple the paper. Yeah, you see your dragon blanket? <laughs> All right, so this is first out that we have a fire. Okay. So when you call 911, you have to tell them what's on fire, because suppose some wires were burning up there on top of the pole. You, you can tell them it's electric line on top of the pole, the engine would go, right? And maybe if that car over there in the parking lot was on fire, we would take the edge. His boots and his coat on, and then the two firefighters sit there and put an air pack on so that when they get there, if it's smoky, they can put the man on back in place. Here, hold, hold it up there. Go ahead. There you go. Good job. Good job. You want to take a turn? Next. Um, this and this. Yeah, so you got a fire hat and then a little goodie bag. Are you excited? Mm -hmm. Good. I am absolutely adoring Deerbrook, and it just makes me think of one of the things that I love about many Victorian novels, particularly Elizabeth Gaskell, is that it's so true to life in parts where there's really beautiful things happening, but really hard, painful things happening. So in this passage, they've been discussing with the doctor, seeing patients, and uh, what can religion be for, or reason, or philosophy, whichever name you may call your faith, but by to show us the bright side of everything, of death among the rest. I have often wondered why we seem to try to make the most of that evil, if evil it be, while we think it a duty to make the least of either. Um, and then I had some such feeling, I suppose, when I was surprised to hear you. I come straight from a deathbed. I do not wonder at all now. So they're having just this really poignant conversation. And then they just start admiring the larks. There were two or three larks hovering above the meadow at this moment, and others were soaring further off. The air was full of lark music. The party stood still and listened. Looking up into the sunny sky, they watched one little warbler wheeling round, falling, rising again, still warbling, till it seemed as if it could never be exhausted. Sophia said it made her head ache to look up so long, and she seemed impatient for the bird to have done. It then struck her that she also might find a nest, like her sister's, until she examined the place whence the lark had sprung. Under a thick tuft of grass in a little hollow, she found a family of infant larks huddled together and pointed them out to her cousins. I just love the contrasts, and life is like that, you know, where you just take a moment to admire the nature around you, even when there's really hard and painful things going on. I just love it. So I just wanted to show you, I'm really loving reading Vanity Fair every night um, before bed. Uh, and so it shows, you know, your new issue has arrived and it takes 14 minutes to read it. Um, and I just love that. And then issue four, like it has it waiting for me. Like it says, again, it'll take 14 minutes to read. So I love that, you know, it has it just like waiting for you. And then issue four, and then it shows me I have 2% read. And then when you finish it, it says like, hurrah, you finished another portion. So yeah, just all very fun and so doable. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really loving this experience and it's making Vanity Fair seem not intimidating in the least. Well, you can't, you have to go on the dark ones, the brown ones. And I go on the, the, uh, the beige colored ones. Those are white ones. Okay, so it's your turn. And yellow ones. Mm -hmm. Now let me show you what I can <laughs> well, Arthur, have you ever eaten a leaf for lunch? <laughs> it is Thursday afternoon, and we went to the library earlier and uh, met with friends, and my dad was there, and he played checkers with Peter and it was a really nice time. It's one of my favorite libraries. So it was really nice to have uh, others there to enjoy it with us. Um, I just wanted to give a little update 
on a couple of the books. I am keeping up to date with everything but John Halifax, a gentleman, which I've just not put pressure on myself. And when it's convenient, like you saw, um, Peter had basketball class last night and I had my e-reader with me for that. So it's convenient there. So like I said, I'm not putting pressure. And then I actually was enjoying it a lot more. Like I said, I don't think it's one to be read, to be sprinted through. And I think I will enjoy it more that way. Um, Unfortunately, The Trail of the Serpent is turning out to be somewhat disappointing. It's basically, this is my issue I have when I read mysteries, when the mystery genre was like a new thing, is that there's not as much nuance to them. The villains are just all villain, and that's much less interesting to me. They're just pure evil, as opposed to in an Agatha Christie the villain really surprises you because it's someone who's a parent or um, who is a child uh, who, you know, you ha you see these really nice aspects of them, of them like caring for their children or a parent who, uh, or a child who's maybe a grown child who's caring for an elderly parent. Do you know what I mean? You see these different aspects of them. And so then it just totally catches you off guard. And I think that's part of the fun of mysteries. Um, Except for cozies. Uh, but anyhow, all to say, um, the parts with the detective, I'm thoroughly enjoying, but we're getting so little of that uh, thus far. Four days out of the seven, I'm on page 176, and it's a lot with the villain. It's very well written, the actual writing style and everything I still really like. Um, but the plot feels like it's meandering a bit. So it's kind of a bummer because I was really enthusiastic about this the very first day that I started it. But it's not quite living up to my enthusiasm. But on the other hand, what is utterly, absolutely, fantastically living up to my enthusiasm is Deerbrook by Harriet Martineau. This so far... It might, I might like this as much as Wives and Daughters. And I know that sound, sounds crazy. And it's probably premature because I'm only 83 out of 500 pages. But I'm telling you, that's how into this I am. That's how easily the reading is coming. And I just love how she pauses for these beautiful moments. Um, after Dr. Edward Hope has written a letter to his brother, he says the door of it, or it says the door of his room opened into the garden. He thought he would look out upon the night. It was the night of the full moon. As he stood in the doorway, the festoons of creepers that dangled from his little porch waved in the night breeze. Long shadows from the shrubs lay on the grass, and in the depth of one of these shadows glimmered the green spark of a glowworm. It was deliciously cool and serene. Mr. Hope stood leaning against the doorpost with his arms folded. <sighs> So I am just eating this book up. I can't wait for tomorrow's chapters. I am doing two chapters a day. Um, you know, I could have like decided to do more, but next week I have three buddy reads at the same time. Um, one of those being Small House at Allington, which I'm only doing two chapters a day. Uh, but the other one, so I don't think I could do more than that, but I'm really excited about that book. And I'm bummed that The Trail of the Serpent isn't living up to my expectations. I'm kind of holding out this probably false hope that in the end it will just be amazing. Um, but I'm bummed because I wanted to like every single Mary Elizabeth Braddon book I read just be like, oh, it was awesome. But I don't think that's going to happen with almost any author. Um, still really enjoying David Copperfield, doing my two chapters a day of that. And I'm really looking forward to tonight. I have all of my other reading done. And tonight I'm going to sit as soon as the boys are in bed and until I go to bed, listen to um, the Mayor of Casterbridge audiobook and just listen to that because it is a page turner. Um, and read my little portion of Vanity Fair. I have to tell you, the very first portion of Vanity Fair, it starts out, we're getting to know 
what kind of lady Becky Sharp is. That She's leaving the school that she's been at for years. And one of the teachers, out of the goodness of her heart, spends a ton of money on a dictionary for her and gives it to her right before she's in the carriage. <laughs> and then she's, so she's like 17 or 18, okay? She's way old enough to know better. And she just chucks the dictionary out of the carriage. I'm like, all right, all right. I, I see how this is going to be. Kind of our, uh, you know, British Victorian Scarlet O'Hara. So I'm really enjoying reading Vanity Fair in the serial reader style, and I don't have any desire to speed up. I think finishing mid-January is totally fine with me. And I hope you enjoyed the little cameo from Peter's Toy Zebras. Hi, everyone. It is Saturday, October the 6th, and Becky is here. Hello, the two. So for those of you who have watched the Talking Amongst Ourselves live shows, Becky is one of the co-hosts. And she's here for the day, so I wanted to see the Arboretum. And I'll show you. I'll cut to it in just a second. We had a picnic by the Whomping Willow. And we just saw the spot. And we weren't sure because there's like a fall festival going on today. So I didn't know how crowded it would be for a picnic. But we just found kind of the perfect spot. So it's a beautiful fall day. And then we're going to head to a Victorian mansion where I host a book club after this. So there is the Whomping Willow. And then we just had our picnic at the bench. Ta-da! <laughs> My favorite part of the Arboretum is this fernery. It has all these amazing different kinds of ferns. This looks like it's like leading to like Snow White's house or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we are at the Ebenezer Maxwell Mansion. So we have a little garden in front of and behind the mansion. And next Friday, we're going to be reading ghost stories here. Hi, everyone. Well, this was not the greatest reading experience. I was so looking forward to this that I said to the ladies, oh, let's read it the first week of October. And now, unfortunately, it's killed my October excitement a little bit. Oh, I just saw a mouse. We have, you have no idea the mouse problem in this house. Snap traps, um, sticky traps, poison. They don't care. They don't care. Anyhow, back to the books. I think that since I am such a mystery lover, there are going to be less Victorian mysteries that I like because at the beginning of the mystery genre, kind of, they were all about plot and less about character development. And so in this, the villain has no nuance whatsoever and is really kind of boring, not compelling to read about. And so it was that aspect of it that kind of killed the book for me because much of the book is just him and you're hearing all of these awful things that he's doing and you are just following all of his dastardly deeds. Um, the mute detective, uh, Joseph Peters, I absolutely loved. And he had this sort of assistant, um, whose name was Cuppins and I really loved her and loved their relationship. And um, they, there were just some neat elements about their relationship and all of those chapters I really enjoyed. It was almost like her entire writing style was very different for the villain chapters. And then for the sleuth chapters, 
um, just a really engaging writing style, but something about it was very aloof with the villain, which I think was intentional because it was consistent. So pretty much the last 100 pages, I just skimmed. I just couldn't take it anymore. I love mysteries where you get into the head of the villain and you kind of, they have surprising motives or these surprising elements about themselves. Um, yeah, I just, I'm really disappointed because I loved Lady Audley's secret so, so much. And it's not a great note to start off October. So I'm pretty bummed. I'm not going to lie. I'm hoping to really like move on and recover, but it's just made me a lot less excited. Like I said, not a great way to do the first week. So it is now 9.30 p.m. and I had, I missed yesterday's chapters of Deerbrook, so I read four chapters of Deerbrook and I definitely feel cheered up and kind of rallying uh, throughout October. And yeah, I just really, I, I'm, I'm pleased that I picked this up. It's so similar in tone and feel um, to Wives and Daughters. And I'm absolutely loving it. It has some great quotes and just some really um, lots of wonderful scenes with all of the characters together, which I appreciate in books. And just great quotes. Um, uh, what in the world is that noise? Asked Margaret. Only somebody killing a pig, replied Sidney decidedly. Do not believe him, said Mr. Enderby. The Deerbrook people have better manners to, than to kill their pigs in the hearing of ladies on summer afternoons. <laughs> So it's just what I love. It has, yeah, just all the qualities that I love about Wives and Daughters and that it has these really funny, lighthearted moments. It has really beautiful descriptions of the settings, um, but also really meaningful conversations between the characters and lots of um, self uh, analysis by the characters of themselves and uh, flawed but still likable characters. I'm really, really excited about it. So I am 130 pages out of 500, uh, and I'm really enjoying having that to go through two chapters a day because now, after really being bummed about that book, it's a really nice treat. It is now Sunday, October 7th. The first week of October will be done tonight. And I just wanted to take a look again at my reading schedule, my reading calendar to see how I feel like I did this first week. Um, I feel like I got through a lot. Didn't get through maybe quite as much as I was hoping, but I'm still very pleased with how much I got through. Um, I kept up with all of my buddy reads, which were really only two, I guess. It was The Small House at Allington and The Trail of the Serpent which I'm so done, glad to be done with Trail of the Serpent. Um, Small House of Allington still have a lot to go, but that's fine because we're on schedule. Deerbrook, I have also kept up with for my, it's just, I'm reading it on my own. And David Copperfield, which I'm reading on my own, and I just finished catching up on the audiobook of that. I have not done good on my Emily Bronte poems. Um, oh, I did Wednesday's Vanity Fair. Um, so I can cross that one off, but that one also is a little bit less pressure because I'm going to be reading it until January anyway, through serial reader. Um, John Halifax, a gentleman, I feel okay with that. I'm like fairly behind on that. Cause I'm just not pressuring myself. Although I think I finished at least six chapters on that one. Um, but obviously that was only Monday's reading for that. The one that I am bummed that I didn't make more progress through is the mayor of Casterbridge. Um, because as you can see next week, um, I have Zoe and Wuthering Heights as additional buddy reads and Zoe is pretty long. So after I'm done editing my reading blog, um, I am just going to sit and listen to as much of the mayor of Casterbridge as I can. I mean, I don't want to ruin the experience by not, by rushing through it too quickly. Um, so I think I've just kind of put John Halifax, a gentleman on the back burner, and I'm just going to take my e-reader with me 
And if I want to, I'll look at that. Um, Vanity Fair, you know, I do want to. And I would ideally like to read some more poems by Emily bon- Bronte, but poetry is really just a grind for me. I just need to get better at it. But I think it's like a muscle you need to to build up. And so I need to work harder at it. So, yeah, overall, I'm very happy. Uh, I really would like to make a ton of progress with the mayor of Casterbridge because I'm worried it will fall through the cracks then. But overall, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how much progress I've made. Middlemarch is on in the background and I am editing and it's just a nice relaxing time. So this is the close of my Sunday and I'll get to logging week two tomorrow. Just planning on doing audiobook of the mayor of Casterbridge tonight.